So, as you guys know, um, a group of us took a trip to Dahabon uh, just last week, and we just we just we arrived back um, this past Sunday, and we decided to use this time this evening to give you a report on how things went in Dahabon. Um, so, to get started, um, uh, whoa, whoa, how about you uh, start us off with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you praise for your grace and mercy that you have provided a way for us to, to spread your gospel throughout the, the entire world, Lord, by opening one door at a time. And for our small congregations here, Lord, you have greatly blessed us in terms of the doors you've opened for us, Lord. And in our trip to Dahabon, Lord, that you have opened the door that we may reach not just one people, but two type, two countries side by side, Lord. And this is amazing work from you. And Lord, we thank you for this church that has been able to support, uh, put their support behind this work. And we ask that we will continue to do so, Lord, and that we would do it in your, just for your glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, so uh, I just realized uh, I, I introduced him as Wowo, mm. and his name is Ron. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Wowo knows many things, <laughs> but we—that's um, that's his affectionate nickname that some of us give him. Um, but uh, I'm going to try really hard to call him Ron for the rest of the evening. But oh. Uh, while I keep trying to do that, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And I'm going to start reading at verse 24. And this is going to give uh, an idea of what, what we're attempting to do right now. So in Acts chapter 14, verse, starting at verse 24, it says this. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. So you might ask, why read that text um, this evening? And the reason is, um, well, one, we see here in this text, we see the end of Paul's first missionary journey. And he's returning back to Antioch. And Antioch is the place where it says here in verse 26, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled, the work that they had just fulfilled. Um, Paul and Barnabas, they left Antioch. They were commended to the grace of God from Antioch to go and um, preach the gospel um, in many different places. Um, but now they've returned to Antioch. And they... Um, and they, when they arrived, they gathered the whole church together in Antioch. And what they did was they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to follow the same pattern. Um, we have been, um, even on this little trip, and we have a larger goal, we have been commended by you Together, um, we have been commended to the grace of God for this work, for this work that we're um, seeking to, to, to do in Dahabon. Um, uh, this is a, uh, and we are returning back to the place where we have been commended for that work. And what we're trying to do is we're, we're arriving and we're gathering you together and we're here to give a report of all God had done while we were out on mission. Um, and one thing, thing I really want to focus on is the fact that this is all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. 
Notice that there's no glory here for Paul or Barnabas. This is all the work of God. So one thing I want to be very clear about is we're going to talk about a number of things. Um, and, but this, this work that we're talking about, um, the good conversations that we've had in Dahabon, the exciting things that you may have read on Slack or in videos you've seen on Facebook, um, this is all the grace of God to us. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're very thankful to be a part of that work. And I want to be careful for myself to um, glorify God in that and not to see any glory for myself in that. Um, I want to be careful for you and I want you to be careful um, to only see the glory of God in that. Um, and, um, and we should all walk away for every success um, and say, man, praise the Lord, glory to God for all that he has done. And even for every disappointment, we can still walk away and say, you know, although that is not um, what I wanted to happen, that wasn't my desire, we can still walk away and say glory to God um, and, and thank, thank the Lord for the opportunity that we've had to work um, in his vineyard. So, um, so that's the purpose of our time together um, today, is to do that, to gather you together, to give this report for what God has done. Um, so uh, we went on a trip. Who came? Um, obviously the three of us, um, uh, Ron, Casimir, um, Edgar, um, myself. Um, we also had um, uh, my wife, Anita. We had um, my daughter, Repentance, and uh, uh, Raquel, um, Edgar's wife. But we, we had two special visitors as, uh, as well. We had Gabby Rusi and Alex Del Cid from Guatemala. Um, and they were a, a very welcome presence and a huge blessing um, to be on this trip. Um, I couldn't stop thinking how kind God is not just to send people from Cornerstone, but to send people from a church that was planted from Cornerstone for this work. Um, no, amen. Uh, also, um, it wasn't just our two churches involved. Um, you had Pastor Guzman's church, uh, Iglesia, ba Iglesia, Iglesia Biblica Trinidad, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, in Santo Domingo. And uh, two brothers, uh, Magdiel and Frankeli. Um, and these are two of the brothers who come every weekend who uh, they hold Bible studies on the Lord's Day. In fact, they're in Dahabon right now. It's, they probably, well, actually they probably just started driving back to Santo Domingo. So they're, they're on the road likely right now, um, going back home. But they go to Dahabon every weekend. Um, they evangelize on Saturdays and they hold Bible studies on the Lord's Day, um, inviting people to the house. Uh, so, we had, we had a pretty large group at the house. Um, the house was prepared uh, thanks to um, the brothers who came and helped on the last work trip, uh, Joby and uh, Papa Lewis and Nick Norman. Uh, Edgar was there uh, with us too on that trip. And uh, those brothers worked very hard painting the house, cleaning the house, uh, fixing all kinds of things in the house, um, putting bunk beds together. Um, so uh, we, we came to a, a place that was very welcoming, a place that was clean, um, somewhere that we can actually stay um, for the week. Um, so I'm going to give you a little rundown of how the trip went from day to day. Um, on, that, the, on Saturday, um, the 13th, uh, it was a travel day. Uh, we basically flew in. Uh, we came to the house. We installed a sign that night that we had brought with us. So our, um, our little church house has a sign now um, telling people what time to get there on Sunday. Um, we, on Sunday, we had a Lord's Day service. Um, we, had a, we had a number of visitors who showed up that Lord's Day. Um, and we also had a nice fellowship together at one of the local restaurants there. We... Um, it was really good to spend some time, especially with uh, uh, Waskar, who is uh, one of the brothers who lives in Dahabon, who's uh, been helping, been a huge help 
in getting things set up down there um, for us to plant the church. Uh, he, or, he organizes a lot of resources behind the scenes uh, while we're gone. It was good to spend time with him and his family. It was also really good to spend time with uh, Frank Kelly and with Magdiel, uh, just because we don't get a lot of chance to talk to them. Um, so that was just really, really um, blessed time to spend with them. Uh, and um, the meat of our trip happened from Monday to Thursday. And those days, we, we spent um, the, a large chunk of the day evangelizing, and then in the evenings, we would have a Bible study. So we would wake up early, have breakfast, have a little meeting, we pray together, and uh, we go out evangelizing in the morning. We spent our mornings doing uh, what I called at the time long form evangelism, very similar to what we do door to door here. Um, you, you spend time with people, you walk through the law with them, you take as much time as you need to get through a gospel conversation with them. It could be a half hour, it can be an hour, it could be longer, however long it takes. Um, then, uh, and we did most of those conversations around the church house, as, as close to the church as we could. Um, in the afternoons, we would go with uh, a bunch of tracks in our hand, and we invite as many people as we can to the Bible studies. Um, so, and, um, and that was just very quick, um, very short conversations, um, explaining to the people where the church is, um, what time to be there, what's, what's going to happen there, what we're going to talk about, and just very quick. Um, so you can, we got through a, a large chunk of the town doing that um, Monday through Thursday. And, um, and in the evenings, we had uh, our Bible study. Um, on, uh, and what we did was we just preached the gospel in our Bible study. We divided those four days up into different parts of a gospel presentation. So on Mondays, we talked about the doctrine of God, who God is. Um, we spent a lot of time explaining Monday how uh, a, a lot of what we learned when we went through that book, None Greater, in small groups, how God is, how, how God is nothing like us. God is not like a superman. He's in a totally different category. Um, and when we talk about God, we need, to, we need to think about who it is that we're, we're talking about. Who, who are we dealing with um, when we're dealing with God? So we talked about that on Monday. Um, on Tuesday, we talked about man and sin. We talked about the fall. We talked about a man's depravity, his sinful nature. Um, we talked about the penalty for sin, what men deserve. Men deserve hell because of their sin. On Wednesday... Uh, which is my favorite night, we talked about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, we talked about who Jesus is and his person. We talked about his two natures. We talked about um, uh, we, um, who he is. Um, we talked about his character. And we also talked about his work, um, his work of redemption, um, his work on the cross and his resurrection. Um, and um, on Thursday, we talked about conversion. We talked about their response. Um, we talked about how it's not enough to know um, the facts about God, the facts about sin, the facts about even Jesus Christ and what he has done, that this requires a response from them and that they must respond in repentance and faith. Um, and each one of the nights, we focused on those topics, but... We hit every topic every night. So it's not like on the, the night that we talked about God, we didn't talk about sin and Jesus Christ and the response. But we would highlight one topic and run through the rest. Um, so um, the people were very receptive. Um, uh, surprisingly, I wouldn't say surprisingly receptive. Those of us who uh, visited there before, were, we had an idea that people would listen um, when we spoke to them um, about um, what the Bible says. But um, it's, it's not something still that we're used to here um, to uh, have so many good conversations in such a short period of time, um, to speak to people and have them actually show up that night um, for a Bible study. Um, so people were very receptive. Um, uh, they were very polite for the most part. It was, um, it was just great. It was a great time. 
Um, we also had a pretty large turnout, um, by God's grace. Uh, uh, quite a number of people came. I think two nights we had 21 people um, come into the house. Um, we, uh, uh, there was just many good conversations. Um, um, and many people, and when they came, it wasn't like, um, you know, we had a dinner and a Bible study when we did it. And uh, you would think, oh man, you know, people would come just for the food. And I, I, was talking with, I was talking with Pastor Mark. I'm fine if they just come for the food. I'll still preach the gospel to them, you know. <laughs> but um, it was clear that they weren't there just for the food. In fact, you had plenty of people who weren't eating. Um, they were there to, to be taught the word of God um, that night. Um, so um, it's very thankful. Um, uh, there were some people, I think, of um, some people that were so attentive, they just stood out, um, like Esther who is the wife of our landlord there. She's a Catholic. Um, she, she said stuff like, man, I never heard this before. Um, we, uh, you know, sometimes when you teach or sometimes when you evangelize, I'm sure many of you have done this before where you would anticipate, uh, anticipate uh, a question that the person you're talking to might have. And so you start to answer that. You might even say something like this, well, um, Someone might think such and such, you know. So I was, I, I was, I think I was talking about um, the relationship between works and faith, and um, and I said something along the lines of, uh, you know, I, I'm sure someone might be thinking, well, you know, uh, Jerome, didn't you just tell me I can't work my way to heaven, and now you're telling me that I must do good works? <laughs> You know, what are you, you know, and uh, when I said that, she's sitting there and she's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, she was just tracking the whole entire time. It was very encouraging to see that. There's another guy named Jose. He, um, he had, he brought his three grandsons and he, um, and I'm teaching and I see um, a light shining at me and that's from his phone. He's holding up his phone the whole time trying to record um, the teaching because he hadn't heard teaching like this before. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my, t it wasn't the fact that it was me teaching and it wasn't my style. The issue is, as you talk to these people, these people had not heard biblical teaching before in their lives. You know, they've been to many churches um, and, th and, and this was something new that someone would explain what the Bible says to them um, very clearly. Um, um, those who were evangelizing individually said, heard many of the same responses. I've never heard these things before. Um, they were, uh, my wife was telling me about um, one of the ladies she was talking to, and as she was going to the scriptures, she, was, she just kept saying, wow, wow, just not knowing that the Bible had said these things. Um, so um, very good response. Um, and uh, we also had um, a lot of Haitians that we talked to as well which um, i you know, been to Dahabon before, saw many Haitians there. Um, I was expecting to encounter Haitians. I just wasn't expecting to encounter as many as we did. Uh, so uh, um, I, you know, I speak very poor Spanish and very poor Creole, but I wasn't planning to speak as much of my poor Creole <laughs> as um, I did when we were down there. Um, similar to what uh, Ron said earlier, um, he, uh, Ron had no problem getting into conversations, you know. So, very good response, very good reception. Um, brothers, did you guys have anything, I know I'm doing all the talking here, any, any stories, any, anything you'd like to add about the reception and the response from the people there? Okay, that's my cue. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I would maybe give a little bit more context. So it's, there was one, there was one conversation I had with Brother Alex where, so imagine something like a lake eel and that is big and so there's a lot of people sitting around and, and they just hang out. You know, some people that are retired or maybe they just don't work, I don't know the case, but so it's, we were kind of in the downtown, I think it was like maybe City Hall mm -hmm. in front of the Catholic Church. You oh, know, yeah. They usually have a big plaza uh, that's, the way that a lot of these uh, cities are designed. You have the Catholic Church, you have a big plaza, and people just kind of hang out. So we talked to this one guy, 
I don't remember his name. I don't want to butcher it, so we'll just, you know, call him person, John. Person A. Yeah, Person A. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. John Doe from <laughs> Dahabon. So, so um, what was fascinating about this conversation was, uh, and Brother Alex was leading the conversation, this, this older gentleman, he had to be maybe, you know, early 50s. And so the main issue of this one conversation was he had not ever been challenged or encouraged or informed of the word of God of the necessity that he has uh, of what biblical, true biblical repentance is. He said, well, so I'm not a good person, but, and he kept on saying this like he really believes it, but I'm just going to try harder. And we'll go and explain, well, you can't try harder. Here's the reason why. I give him an illustration. And I'm like, so does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that makes total sense. I'm like, amen, it's making sense. So, so, so if you hear this truth and the word of God says you have to respond, uh, what is the response? I'm just going to try harder. <laughs> and so, you know, there is a sense where you've, you know, of course, we're in another country. I'm like, maybe we're getting punked. You know, maybe there's cameras somewhere. <laughs> because, um, but, he, but the part that really is encouraging, and then we might laugh about it because it, it, it seems humorous, is the genuine ignorance, the, genu the genuine lacking of clear, logical, objective, rational truth from the Word of God. Uh, and, and I was thinking about um, a particular text that came to mind that I'm sure we've all maybe at some point or another heard, which was in Acts uh, chapter 8. And it was the, in the narrative of the Ethiopian and um, when he's writing and, and, and he's encouraged. And it's interesting because um, when Philip shows up and this man is reading from the scroll of Isaiah, the fascinating thing is that the text says that after he reads the text, uh, the eunuch answered, verse 34 of chapter 8, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? So he's been reading the whole time. He's been getting understanding of some sort of from the Bible or whatever the case is, but he cannot put the pieces together. And so praise God that there was many cases like that. Earlier I talked about a little bit about MoMA, mm -hmm. uh, older, a very sweet lady, and we couldn't get into too much of the story, but even with her, her issue was you could see the, the tension in her face. The, I, that makes sense, but my, Catholic, my family's Catholic, and I can't just leave, you know, and this, this pressure, and in, in you could see it. And then her, it's funny because her, her son comes in, and he's like, um, he's hearing the conversation the whole time, by the way. And then at one point he says, well, you know, she's, uh, she's got to get back to work. She's, uh, and I said, wow, well, I'm sorry. I showed up and she was lounging. So I'm thinking she's not working, you know. And so, and she wasn't working. Well, she's got to cook. And I said, well, you know, that's okay, no problem. But it was interesting because even then she says, she tells her son, calm down, calm down. We're talking, you know. <laughs> um, and, and so even then you see the grace of God in this woman. The, the spirit of God is giving her truth. The Spirit of God is applying this truth. And I think that really those scenarios, and we've seen this in our church, is to continue to repeatedly, lovingly go over it and pray and talk to them and teach them. And so uh, there's so many stories that, that, that I could say. Those two, I guess, really kind of uh, pop out. Uh, okay, maybe one more because mm -hmm. we have time. So there was these two uh, young ladies at the park, and... and um, uh, Brother Alex was engaging them, and they were very, like, skeptical, like, you know, I guess these people are not used to being talked like that or, or engaged with the gospel. And so it was probably like a 45-minute conversation. Uh, one of them was very lax, lackadaisical, like she was not caring. The other one, like the rest of the day, one would tell, like, something, something serious had struck her uh, because even her demeanor had changed by the end of the conversation, and... And, you know, they had to leave, but you could tell that the Spirit of God was engaging her mind, engaging her mind on this idea of if I die when I, because I don't know when I'm going to die and the truth of the Bible says that I'm going to die, you know, what is going to happen to my soul? What is, where am I going to go? Who's going to pay for my sins? Am I going to do it? And if I pay it, then I go to hell. If Christ is going to be my substitute then uh, obviously there's, there's a blessing because I could be, I can have reconciliation with God. So if there was something I could encourage us as we think about these stories, there's always some encouragement is 
brethren, do not shy away from the simplicity of the gospel. I know that in America, we believe that everybody knows it. Everybody doesn't know it. Pastors don't even know that. And, it, it, and if, you know, you could see all, all the, you know, false churches that are up. So we should rejoice in the beauty of the gospel. We should rejoice that that beauty is based on the simplicity of the gospel. Uh, because when we're over there, <laughs> we're not having debates on eschatology. We're not having debates on dispensationalism. We're really trying to slowly, carefully, lovingly point them to Christ. Point them to the beauty of the simplicity of how is it that a good God has died for evil men and how it is that uh, that work of Christ uh, has been provided so that because by the grace of God we can respond to repentance and faith. Uh, we could be in Christ forever and have all those blessings. Amen. Yeah, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. And, uh, <clears throat> do you have anything, brother? Uh, well, it's, uh, it reminds me of the one conversation we have with uh, a, a young kid called Jason. Yeah, Jason. Uh, which which is kind of like a weird name for a, a Haitian. <laughs> Never seen a Haitian <laughs> named Jason. Um, <laughs> But uh, the conversation started with him. Um, basically, he's selling services like shoe shining. Uh, there's a lot of kids like that going about town. Uh, uh, so we started talking to him, and some of the first questions we asked him is about uh, uh, about the law and stuff like that. He's never heard what is law. He's never heard of that. Uh, but one of the the way he answers, he says he's never sinned in any of those ways. And at first I was kind of like making fun a little bit. I said, looks like we found the only perfect guy in the universe. <laughs> uh, but throughout the conversation, you can tell that he started uh, changing his tune uh, according to that. And, and he, one of the things we emphasize with him is that how lucky he is to be hearing this gospel. Uh, because we told him that we come very far away and here he is on the side of the street and here we are talking to him in the middle of the street, both me and uh, Jerome. We, I, we, we've spoken to this kid longer than anybody else. Yeah. So uh, I think we spent about an hour and a half yeah. Yeah. in the hot sun uh, with no shade. <laughs> uh, but it, it was a great uh, opportunity to talk to this kid, but also we all, I saw this kid as a representative of so many uh, uh, other souls that we saw that we weren't able to talk to. Uh, so it was encouraging uh, that, first of all, he stood there the entire time, and uh, some of the things he's, he heard was pretty much for the first time. And it's, I think of the, the best feeling for when you evangelize is knowing that the person might be hearing certain things for the first time and it's coming from you. Uh, even though you don't know what's going to happen to that uh, uh, with the word that's, that they heard, but the fact that you were the first messenger to that person in terms of the gospel is is very encouraging. Yeah, Jason was one of those guys who who said, "I never heard this before." Remember him saying that? Yeah. And um, uh, and you, you just think about it. You know, um, there's a, you know, he's a Haitian. Jason was a Haitian, in the on the Dominican side. Um, it's it's already not normal for someone to go walk up to a Haitian to have a conversation, on that side of the border, and so he has. Um, he has Ron, a Haitian, um, who comes from America <laughs> on the other side of the border to preach the gospel to him, <laughs> you know, and, um, and to invite him to a church um, that would be unheard of for a Haitian to be um, welcome to come to uh, and, uh, and to have this long conversation with him. Uh, so, man, what a blessing um, it is to, to guys like Jason and what a blessing it would be in the future um, for more people like Jason. Um, so, you know, um, I want to um, uh, make a few calls to action 
you know, um, and then we'll open up the floor for questions. Uh, one, I just want to encourage you to pray. Um, and I divide my prayers up into, I used to have three categories, but now I have four. Um, and they all start with a P, so you can remember them. Um, first is purpose. Purpose, people, pastor, and process. For the purpose, um, pray that the, um, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ would spread and that his name would be glorified um, on both sides of that border, in Dahabon and in Haiti. Um, people, pray, pray that the Lord would build up a core group, a core group of believers in Dahabon um, for us to plant the church. I think we're already seeing the seeds of that. I think you saw the seeds of that in the pictures and the videos that you saw. Um, we're seeing the seeds of that. So pray that the Lord would continue that work. Um, pastor, um, pray for me and my family. Um, um, pray for our, um, our acquisition of the Spanish language. Um, pray that um, the Lord um, would prepare me in, um, in maturity um, for ministry down there. Um, the same with my wife um, in being able to support the ministry and to, um, you know, deal with all of the, the family things in a different country. Um, um, you know, pray for my kids to be able to be, become acclimated um, to this new, this new country, this new culture. Um, also, along with praying for the pastor, pray, pray for um, a family to come and move down with us. Uh, especially if that family would be a, a Spanish-speaking family. That would be a huge help to us. Uh, so, and then process. Um, pray that the Lord would give us wisdom, that he would guide our steps in all the logistics of moving down there. There are a lot of things. It's like a, I have a list at home, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger of all the things that need to be done to move to another country. It's already hard. Like, think about it. If you had to move from one apartment to another, that's like, that's not easy. You know, no one likes to move, right? Now, you know, now try to move from one city to another in Florida and then increase that from one state to another state and now increase that from one country to another country, right? It's very difficult. So, and there's so many decisions to make. Um, so pray that the Lord would uh, give us wisdom in that, that he would guide our steps in that. Um, and he's already answering many of those prayers as well. So purpose, people, pastor, and process. Um, the, the next call to action is um, consider moving. Consider moving down there with us. So um, our lives are not our own. And uh, we are not on this earth um, for our own pleasures. Uh, we are not on this earth um, to live for the weekends. And I want to encourage you to consider uh, moving down there. You might be in a situation where that's something that you could seriously consider. So if that is something that you can, uh, can consider doing, I would say do that. Um, think about that and do it prayerfully and do it with much wise counsel. Um, but consider moving down there with us. Uh, we would love um, whatever gifts that the Lord has given you. We would love to see you be able to serve in that way. We would also um, love your companionship. Um, and moving to and move, um, be becoming a part of a different culture is difficult. I'm, I'm not originally from Orlando. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. And it was hard moving from there to here. I thought everyone in Orlando was weird, you know? <laughs> It took a good six months to a year to get used to it. Well, it's going to be even harder going down there. So, um, so consider moving. And also, too, um, consider giving. Um, this, is, this is a work that, um, that requires funds to do. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to need to be full-time as a pastor down there. I'm going to um, need to have money to live and to support my family. Um, the church is going to need money to operate, and, um, and that is going to be done um, by your faithful giving, by your faithful gifts, faithful and cheerful gifts. So um, consider giving, and consider um, how the, um, however much it is that the Lord would have you to, to give. Um, be prayerful about that, and you can even make that decision through much wise counsel. Um, but consider giving um, as the Lord has put on your heart. And, and do that, again, prayerfully and with counsel. Um, so uh, I want to um, 
also, too, before I open up the floor for questions, I also want to mention that um, our next trip is going to be um, uh, on June th from June 30th to July 6th. That's June 30th to July 6th. And um, I'm going to call a meeting for any of you who are interested in coming on that trip on April 18th, Sunday, April 18th. We'll have it immediately after morning service um, and we'll meet in one of the classrooms on the side. So Sunday, April 18th. I'm gonna um, ask Ms. Karen to put that in the announcements um, that you guys will read in your uh, small groups on Tuesday and Wednesday. But um, the next trip is from June 30th to July 6th. And if you're interested in that trip, um, come to the meeting on April 18th and we'll talk about um, the plans for that trip, the purpose of that trip, and, um, and then we'll do our best to um, get a group of people um, to actually go um, and evangelize and um, uh, work for the Lord in Dahabon. Um, but now uh, it's question time. So um, are there any questions? I'm sure there's some. Andy. So, so uh, I know that you mentioned recently that there was an update to how we could give in comparison to having some of those commitment cards that we previously filled out. And so yes. for those of us that are here or those of us that are watching online, what's the best way to give? What's the, what's the most convenient for your ministry? Yeah, thanks for asking that question because I was supposed to mention that. Um, so um, you know how we have the table out front and we have these commitment cards that we had on the table? And we fill out the commitment cards. You put it in the little box. Um, well, I've taken away the commitment cards because they just confused everything. So in order to give, go to missionsdahabon.org. Missionsdahabon.org. And from there, you can um, set up your giving, set up your automated giving. It can come from your bank account or credit card. And, um, and you can set yourself up for automated giving. And, um, and that is the best way um, to give. So missionsdahabon.org is the way to do that. Uh, we'll, we'll have a new type of card likely in the future where it'll just have the website on there. And so instead of you filling something out, it'll just be a little call to action. It says, hey, go to this website and, um, and uh, I'll sign up for giving. Yeah, so thank you, Andy. Mr. Sixto. This is a follow-up on what Andy asked. So is it, because I know I went to global service and set up there, is that the same thing? Yep, that's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, that, that website that I just gave you is just an easier link to go to. It'll, it'll redirect straight to the global services website, global service network. Sergio. Let's ask the believers that are there in Dahabon, mm -hmm. um, how did they come to faith? Like, since, like, if there's no church, like, was it, was that a product of, like, evangelism? Like, how did they come to? Yeah, very good question. So, um, right now, the only believer um, that we know um, with a credible profession of faith is uh, Waskar. Um, and uh, Waskar is Pastor Guzman's brother-in-law. And um, which means that he's uh, Pastor Guzman's wife's brother, right? So, um, um, so uh, man, I wish you guys could meet uh, Clara Guzman, Pastor Guzman's wife. She is the sweetest thing, and she is a very she's very fervent in evangelism. She loves her town, and um, she loves her family. And she, um, I think you were there. Um, one of the times we were out evangelizing with. I think, Pastor Mark, you were there with us before, too. Uh, you should see her going, how, uh, when we go house to house, she's going to the gates of houses, screaming into the neighbors' houses uh, to speak to them. Um, well, she had, um, I talked to Waskar on this trip, and she had been evangelizing to him for years, you know. And um, he, um, he was a very heavy drinker. Um, he, um, he mentioned that he, uh, you know, uh, lived in, you know, uh, just, mu just a lot of sin. Just a lot of, a lot of sin, especially sin very common to men. 
and he uh, he had uh, after having been evangelized to by his sister, um, he had heard um, some uh, preachers on the television, and um, he um, he detailed to me, you know, when he uh, believes that he um, turned from his sin to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, mix up in there because, you know, he didn't have biblical teaching available to him. So he had hopped around from church to church um, with no success. And during that time, um, he got a lot of instruction from Pastor Guzman, from his sister Clara on um, what what he really needs, you know. Um, and uh, he got he got to the point where he stopped uh, uh, after having turned from his sin um, and putting his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he um, he stopped going to the Pentecostal church that um, with a woman pastor that um, he, uh, he and his family were going to, and he um, uh, he just didn't have anywhere to go, you know. And um, he's been very excited that we've been going down there, and I can't tell you like. Uh, um, uh, maybe excitement's not the word. I mean, he has been um, so excited, uh, working tirelessly um, f- uh, to make sure that we get down there safely each time. He's been doing so much work in between times of us going down there. Um, he's showing um, not just in his words, but he's showing in his actions that he cares for good gospel preaching, that um, uh, that he um, he desires to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in the time that he spends in fellowship with us. We see that in the way that um, he pushes the guys from Santo Domingo, like to uh, evangelize on Saturday, like even yesterday, um, just you know texting back and forth. You know he's just pushing them. <laughs> he wants them to get up earlier and to <laughs> and to go out, uh, stay later. <laughs> you know so. Um, uh, you know, I think he's genuinely converted, and um, he's been a big encouragement. Um, and to, it, it got to the point where he, he didn't want us to go on the last trip. He didn't want us to come home. He was about to cry at the beach, you know. I was about to cry. We're all about to cry, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, yeah, he's a good brother. Yeah, um, as far as learning the language, if you don't, if you don't know Spanish, do you all have any recommendations as far as, you know, good programs or resources, you know, to, to prepare to, you know, to go to Dahabon to, you know, so that way, yeah, for preparation? Yeah, um, so um, I'm taking classes right now. I take classes um, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the morning um, at this, with the same language school that my, uh, my daughter and I attended. Um, back in September when I was out for a month. Uh, and that's been going pretty well. Um, and uh, we have some, uh, uh, we have some plan, you know, there's, um, there's interaction here with people who speak Spanish that I get to have regularly. Um, we also have some plans um, here soon where, um, uh, we're, we're, I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna work out, but we're going to, we're, we're thinking about um, doing some Spanish language work with some sermons that Pastor Mark has preached in the past and seeing about working with the group that's been meeting um, with Edgar on Thursday nights. So we're getting as much Spanish practice as we can um, before going down there. And, um, you know, uh, we'll, see, we'll see what the Lord will, will, bring, of, will bring of that. role do Pastor Guzman play in planting that church down there? Is uh, that church down there um, going to help this church financially? I know you say there's pastors that's there now from their church. That's one. And two, um, if you have no one from here to go down there with you, is, this, is there still the same moving date? to be down there even though no one from the church is going down with you if that Yeah, that's very good two questions. Um, So his role is mainly a support role um, and that he's already fulfilling right now and sending brothers down there every weekend. Um, 
And um, Pastor Guzman's been very clear that he's willing to help in whatever way that we need, even to the point of, the poten of potentially sending a family to be with us, you know, to help with translation and things if we need that. That's not like, none of that's set in stone. Of course, that's about, you know, that a lot of that depends on if he's able and if there are families in his church that are able um, to do that. Um, as far as um, a family moving down with us and the date changing, I think it's, it just depends. Um, there's, um, there's a bunch of, you know, it would be great and, um, to have a family, a Spanish-speaking family, move down with us similar to how the Mudges have the Rusis. Um, that would be um, plan A. Um, but there's a, um, there's a bunch of uh, in-between options even if we can't make that work. So um, could that change the date? Possibly, you know, if we get to um, our stated uh, goal of January and we realize, yeah, this isn't gonna work, then it could set things back further. Um, or there could be intermediate options where, you know, maybe we don't have someone living down there, but maybe we have people on a rotation to visit, things like that. Uh, maybe there, like, and maybe there's someone from Pastor Guzman's church who'll be able to come so many times a week to help. You know, uh, so uh, it, it sort of depends on how things look at that time. Ben. And can't walk, can't walk out, man. You gotta run, man. Mm. <laughs> um, are, are you guys able to follow up any of these folks that you had met before? I didn't know how, how communication would occur if you know that would happen, or just phones. I mean, I don't know what people have down there, but yeah. So we we've got a bunch of names and phone numbers um, from previous trips. We we created a WhatsApp group, and um, I added a bunch of Spanish speakers from the church onto that group. And we've had a fair bit of communication, and it slowed down, not just from, every, even from myself, <laughs> um, slowed down, but um, uh, I'm actually in the process of trying to create a better plan for uh, uh, engaging with the people more while we're away. But I think mo more of that is going to be um, delegated. So it's gonna, I think it's a lot more of it's gonna look like giving names and numbers We'll have a WhatsApp group and things like that, but I think it'll be more of working through Waskar, working through some of the guys that come from Pastor Guzman's church um, that, that travel there from Santo Domingo, and actually having them uh, look for people, you know, face to face down there while we're away. I think that'll be a little more effective option. So probably a mix of things, you know, to keep in contact with as many. I know also too, like the ladies. Um, Gabby Rusi's helping um, Anita with this um, right now. They're, um, they're, they're really on top of the WhatsApp game. So um, uh, I think they, um, they're, they're already making some separate lady plans too, which is really good. <laughs> yeah. Pastor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you mentioned a couple of different landmarks, Santo Domingo, um, the beach, can you share, and even the border too with Haiti. Mm -hmm. Can you share um, kind of like distance wise so we can get a picture of yeah. where, where is the Havon and the church in relation to other key landmarks like the coast and the major cities? Ah, very good. Yeah, thank you, brother. So um, obviously you have one, one, one big island, uh, Hispaniola. Um, and on that island, on the east side of the island is the Dominican Republic, and on the west side is Haiti. Um, Dominican Republic is roughly two-thirds of the size of the island, with Haiti being about one-third of the size. Um, Santo Domingo is south-central. It's on, it's on the coast um, to the south of the island. Dahabon is right on the border with Haiti. In fact, Dahabon is one of the, I think it's four border crossings um, that they have um, in the country. So, um, and it's the only border crossing in the north. Um, um, there, so from Santo Domingo to Dahabon, it's a five hour drive. Um, and um, there's also another city, Santiago, 
which is um, north of Santo Domingo and east of Dajabon. And it's two and a, it's three hours, two and a half hours if Edgar is driving. And uh, <laughs> uh, he's saying uh, it's two hours when I'm joking. Right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's two and a half to three hours, depending on traffic. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. Um, uh, um, and that's um, Santiago is kind of turned into the city that we like to fly into because it's a shorter drive to Dahabon from that city. So, yeah. uh, the beach. Um, there's two beaches, um, but the beach that we went to this last time is uh, in a town called Monte Cristi, and it is north of Dahabon, about half hour, 45 minutes from Dahabon. It's a very beautiful beach. No tourists at this beach, because um, there's no tourists on this side of the country at all. <laughs> and um, Punta Cana is like all the way on the other side. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, there's a beach there, and there's also a beach that is 20 minutes away from Dahabon, real close. Yeah. J Alex and then yeah. Jamila. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've been going there like every three or four months for the past year. How fruitful has the evangelism been? Like, how many people? would you say have been adding to the Bible studies on the weekends? I was just curious about that. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, most of our trips um, in the past have been like preparatory for this last trip. So uh, most of the trips haven't been uh, purely evangelistic. Um, like the trip we took in um, September, I wasn't even in Dahabon for most of the time. I was just attending a Spanish language school. Um, the trip in February was a work trip where we were working on the house, you know. Um, so uh, this was actually, this last trip was actually our very first trip where it is just evangelistic. It was like a big deal <laughs> for us to get to this point. Um, so um, this was our first try at a Bible study. I mean, we've had, let me, let me take that back. We've, on prior trips, we've had like, um, we did invite people out to Bible studies and things like that, um, but um, they weren't necessarily, the, it wasn't, the, the purpose of the trip wasn't purely evangelism in each of those trips. Um, there was some work that we had to, to get done, generally. So um, I think this trip is the model for that. And right now, um, I think we had two nights with around 21 people showing up. Um, of those 21, I think about 12 came almost every night. Mm -hmm. So you can say about 12 would be a safe number. Uh, let me just add one thing. One of the things is we learned a few things, uh, especially talking to Haitians, uh, that as we went around town inviting Haitians, some of them are, were happy to come, but there were natural limitations. Like they said, they couldn't be on the Dominican side after a certain time, like after 7 o'clock. So that's one of the things we learned. Let me yeah. and, and those are not people we crossed over to talk to those who were people working in the Dominican, Dominican side, like regular jobs, like mechanics, uh, any kind of your vendors. Maids. Yeah, yeah maids. So th that, that was uh, another limitation where we couldn't get more of the Haitians to actually join, but we did have a few. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamila, I think Jamila had a question. Yes, um, quick question. What is the relationship between the Haitians and the Dominicans? You mentioned that Jason was working on the Dominican side and it would be odd for you guys to speak to him. Mm -hmm. And then um, as far as the border, um, does it work the same way where Dominicans are crossing over to Haiti or is it a prosperity thing where the Haitians are coming over to shop and find work and things or what's the difference there? Yeah, so um, relationship first. Um, so yeah, there's this, uh, there's this misconception that um, Dominicans just hate Haitians. Um, and uh, that misconception comes from Americans looking at relationships between the Dominicans and Haitians and applying things that have happened in the past in America and assuming it's the same thing in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, for instance, um, an American would say, oh man, Dominicans, they'll, they'll treat Haitians differently based on the color of their skin. 
and you know you go through these checkpoints and they'll look in your car and they'll look for a dark skinned person and um, and they'll and they'll ask them for their papers you know um well uh the um you know they have a real problem with illegal immigration and um how do you tell if there's a Haitian or not, if someone's a Haitian or not, it's pretty easy to tell who's a Haitian um, when you're there. It's, it's by the color of skin. But, but it's not for the same reason that uh, people have hated people here for the color of their skin. Um, so, uh, it, you know, um, so there, is, there are issues, there are tensions between Dominicans and Haitians. Um, some of that has to do with illegal immigration. And there are people, just like there's people everywhere, who are partial to one another. Who will hate one another for various reasons because of our sin, um, but um, so you do see a strain in relationships, but um, it's nowhere near as bad as what you uh, might see in media or in some documentaries that I've seen. Um, some of those are um, contrived things that people have made up uh, because of just foolish thinking. Um, uh, now, as far as like uh, with their the, the travel across the border. Um, you do see, you don't see a lot of Dominicans traveling into Haiti. Um, some do for various reasons. In fact, our landlord does. He's a musician. So he travels into Haiti to, to play trumpet, you know. Um, but um, there, um, there are a lot of Haitians um, that cross over into the Dominican Republic uh, to do business, uh, especially in Dahabon, because there's a big market in Dahabon where all those things that people donate to Haiti. Um, uh, what happens is they get donated to Haiti, they make it to those border markets, and they get sold to Dominicans. That's how a lot of, that's how a lot of that money is made. Um, so um, there's market days, Monday and Friday. There's a lot of Haitians in town on those days. There's also, just like uh, Ron said, uh, many uh, Haitians that come across the border on other days during the week uh, to do various jobs, whether that, like I said, mechanics, maids, um, some people just sell goods, you know. Um, you see a lot of uh, Haitian ladies going around selling sweet potatoes and garlic and uh, whatever's in season during that time of year. Um, so, um, so there is a strain, um, but um, it's a cooperative strain, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it's um, uh, and from what I've seen and from what the descriptions of things that I hear, um, you know. People people get along with each other pretty well, especially in Dahabon. Um, there's a lot of people with French last names. They un they know exactly where those French last names come from. It's because they have Haitian blood, <laughs> and um, and uh, you know. So there's a you know you, you find a lot of people in Dahabon who even speak a little Creole. Yeah. So, uh, Barbie. Um, have you guys started the um, transaction for, you know, when you move there, would you need mm -hmm. a visa to stay, or how, how does that work? Because I remember from Pastor Marcos and Ashley and the Russes when they moved there, they started uh, the paperwork, since you're, you guys are U.S. citizens. Yeah. Um, um, well, that process, um, there's a lawyer in Pastor Guzman's church that um, I'm friends with, and we've talked a bit about that process. We'll likely start that paperwork process when we, um, after we move there. In, in the Dominican Republic, you can um, stay there for a very long time on a visitor's visa um, and then start to work on um, becoming a, um, a resident from there. Um, there is a possibility of possibly getting that started earlier, and we're going to like broach that subject this year. Uh, that's kind of on. That's one. That's part of the things on that long list <laughs> of logistics, you know. Um, but it's uh, uh, my understanding is that um, it's it's a lot easier to get that done in the DR because it's uh, it's pretty common for people to move from the U.S. to the DR. Uh, for various reasons, a lot of retirees move there. Um, it's because it's a tourist destination, things like that. So they have a system in place to to work that out. Guru, and then Alfredo. Yeah. So it wasn't tonight, but uh, <clears throat> there's a previous talk that you, <clears throat> that you had where you mentioned that um, when you spoke to people over there, mm -hmm. they tended to actually come to the, the service, like yeah. even that same day. <clears throat> like, why do you, 
Why do you think that is? Is that like a, just a cultural thing or why do you think that is? You know, some of it could be cultural. You know, one thing that's different there from here is that um, people have a, more respect for um, religious things. You know, so if you walk up to someone with a Bible, um, they, they tend to listen to you. Uh, we even went outside of a bar and, um, and we were talking to some people sitting on the edges of that bar and, um, and they stopped to, to talk to us, you know, while they're, you know, you know, uh, getting drunk. So, um, so some of that could be, but, you know, I, just from the responses that we've been getting from people, um, and the fact that they would follow those, you know, follow up their responses by actually coming and so consistently, um, it makes me think that the Lord is working on people's hearts and um, that there's um, for, and that he's causing some people to understand that there's something that they're missing um, and that what they have is a sham. Uh, there's a number of people who mentioned, without knowing the gospel, just mentioning that um, they, they've seen so much hypocrisy in churches um, and, um, and how glad they were to hear um, just, just clear teaching from the Bible. So, um, you know, I don't know for sure, but um, I, think, I think to me, I, 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 the evidence seems to suggest that the Lord's at work, you know. Alfredo. Um, I was curious, are you guys able to, or did you guys cross into, into the Haitian side while you were in Dahabon? We didn't this time. We did in February um, to uh, get some footage. Uh, we, we couldn't this time because there was an order from the government that Dominicans couldn't pass over into Haiti. Um, obviously, we aren't Dominican, but it would have been kind of tough to get across. Um, so we just kind of went to the border just to um, show the folks who came, um, uh, particularly like Gabby, Alex, um, um, those who haven't seen the border, kind of to show them how it looks. But yeah, we didn't cross over. And generally, um, unless there's a really good reason to cross over, um, we wouldn't cross. It's because of the, um, you know, there's, there's potential dangers on the Haitian side of the border. Um, there's less rule of law. And um, uh, so um, we would, we'll be really cautious about, you know, the reasons why we'd cross. But there are reasons to cross. And um, so we, we might cross sometimes in the future. Brother Ron. Uh, you had mentioned that you had gotten a list of names of people you had talked to this trip. Mm -hmm. um, have you been able to share that with Pastor Guzman? Is it, is it uh, something you, you would think to do? Um, and will they be able to follow up with those people? Yeah, so the, the plan is to, um, we haven't shared that yet. Um, just, uh, um, we're still, it's on the list. <laughs> but um, it'll likely be shared, not necessarily directly with Pastor Guzman, but with the brothers that he's... Um, delegated the work um, of Dahabon to. So Frankeli, Magiel, another brother named David, um, another one, Jose. So um, those brothers will get those names and numbers and uh, will likely work out some system of follow-ups um, in that way. Any other questions? Sometimes it's hard to tell if someone's got their hand up while you guys, you know, stroking your hair and rubbing your noses. Okay, Oliver. With the planning, I guess that's the last P of the, the prayer request. Yeah. Um, part of, I guess, what's going to let you know when you're going to be able to move, if the January date is going to be there, mm -hmm. is part, part of it is the financial, right? Yep. Okay. Can you help us understand where um, the monthly goal, where that applies or how? Yeah. How is how where all that is going in a sense? Yeah, yeah. So you know, our monthly goal um, is put together um, not as like a big number that we kind of came up with, you know, but as um, we we took the things that um, we need to live on, we created a budget from that, we put uh, money on that, 
and and um, that's where that monthly gold number um, right now is $6,500 a month of what we um, we we believe we'll, we're going to need to uh, to live one as a family down there and two to operate the church. So there's two things there. It's not just my salary, but also the operation of the church. And um, um, and you know there's a and in that within that budget there's a lot of things that are cheaper than the United States, um, particularly things that originate in the country are, are much cheaper. Uh, certain types of foods, um, certain certain types of services, certain types of goods um, are cheaper. But there are some things that are wildly more expensive over there. Um, there's also a number of things in that um, budget number that. Um, wouldn't apply to a Dominican, but does apply to an American moving to the Dominican Republic, particularly a missionary. So when you when you consider things like um, return trips to the United States, those things are factored into the budget. For instance, we have the mudges here this weekend. Those types of things need to be factored in. Um, for a family of nine, that could be quite a bit. Um, you have, um, you know, uh, even simple things like, um, uh, you know, like some of the more expensive things, gas, electricity, wildly more expensive down there um, than they are here. So there's just a number of things to consider, um, and um, that's, that's kind of how we build that number up to where it is. Um, uh, there's also going to be um, an understanding, too, that the money that's being saved up from now until... Uh, January is going to be put towards our moving expenses. So there's all sorts of um, um, there's things that we can buy over there, um, but there are many things that are wiser to have here and to ship. Um, you know, so a lot of things that we buy here are made in America, or are even if they're not made in America, they're bought off of a pipeline that makes it really cheap to buy them in America. But um, a lot of imported goods over there, um, even things like pots and pans, um, can be extremely expensive. So uh, things like that um, make the budget number where it is. And that's also one of the reasons why we're encouraging you guys to give uh, now, uh, is because that money is going to be used in those moving expenses, Lord willing, when we get to uh, our, our goal is January next year. No, Tom. I know this may be a little irregular, brother, but can I ask um, Mark Mudge a question? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Just give you a break. Yeah. Thank you, brother. <laughs> uh, hello, brother. This morning in Sunday school, you mentioned that there are some brothers that are coming over from the church led by Ryan for an evangelism trip later this year. And you mentioned that one of the goals is going to be to travel up north uh, to evangelize in an, in an area where I believe one of your, your members lives. Is it three or four hours away or somewhere there? And in that, you said that one of the goals of that trip is to consider a church plant up there. And so my question to you is, when you go up there to consider the church plant, are you going over there to consider raising up someone from Guatemala to plant that church or to bring in someone from America to, um, as an elder there? And I'm referring to Titus and the, the in Titus when, when, when the Apostle Paul describes how to raise up elders from among the people. That's the basis of my question. So that's a good question, brother. Uh, th to be honest, we're a long ways off from any sort of church plant. It's just an idea since we have different people who are traveling from a long ways away, many hours to come. It makes sense that there should be a churches out there for them to be able to attend to. So to be honest, I think the Lord could do that in different ways. I think the Lord could raise up people from Guatemala, and that's my desire and prayer, is that people will be raised up from our church to be able to go there. When you have natives that are going in their own country, it goes faster, it goes cheaper. The people know the language better, the culture better, et cetera. 
So it's a little faster, the process. So that would be a, a great desire, and that's a sign of a healthy church, too, that's able to send their own people. So that would be my desire in prayer, that we're sending Guatemalans to, to plant churches in Guatemala. But if the Lord could raise up other missionaries, the need is great, uh, and the labors are few. So I might be open to either one of those possibilities, biblically speaking, I think. Thanks. Anything else, brother? <laughs> Mike. Um, do you guys have a, I guess, a desired time frame of when you guys might be streaming, you know, the services, um, you know, and putting them on platforms like, like Sermon Audio? Do, do you guys have a time frame, a desired time, time frame of when y'all would like to get to that point? Um, you know, I, I would, I would like to have the sermons recorded as soon as we're down there. Um, you know, how that's exactly going to look and what platforms those will be on. Um, I can't say at the moment, um, what I'll, what I'll likely do is rely on folks like Edgar, who's an expert in that type of category and work that through him. But, um, the plan is to, uh, um, definitely record things and to be able to be held accountable in that way for my sermons to be heard. Um, that was just another hand. Uh, <laughs> 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 was that? I don't know, Catley? Was that? <laughs> um, last time you said that. Um, on your last update, there's a pastor in the Dominican Republic that you talked to. Do you keep in touch with the pastor in Haiti? I think it's Pastor Tony. Yeah, I haven't talked to Pastor Tony in uh, quite some time. I know that Pastor Mark is in contact with Pastor Tony. Um, so we, 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 our plan is to, once we're down there, uh, is to resume um, help for Pastor Tony. But right now, the way we're looking at um, the best way to help Pastor Tony is to get him involved in Pastor Guzman's Pastors Academy. Um, we intend um, to be involved in that Pastors Academy when we plant the church down there. And, um, and we think that the best help for Tony is to plant the church in Dahabon and to have someone close by that's able to help him, you know, and disciple him um, and those things. Uh, follow up? Does he visit? I'm sorry? Yeah, the last, does he visit? He hasn't visited, you talking about the Pastors Academy or us? Yeah, does Pastor Tony visit who, us? Um, no, but I, you know, I didn't invite him um, in the last two trips. I think um, a trip before we did have a meeting with him. I think that was the one, we visited him. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we haven't, we haven't really kept up communication, um, the last two trips, but mainly because, um, uh, he hasn't been particularly the purpose of those trips. So we've kind of put things on hold with Pastor Tony until we're going to be down there permanently. Is there another hand? I thought I saw another hand. Is that Alfredo or Barbie? Okay. Well, Probably do Barbie, and I think we'll end it here. I'm going to ask you this verse, probably too early. Mm -hmm. um, you know you're studying the language, Spanish mm -hmm. and Cleo. Mm -hmm. um, time frame would be, what, January 2022? Mm -hmm. um, my question is, how confident do you think you'll be whether if you might need a translator or would you, I don't know, anything's possible, be able to yeah. start preaching Spanish, like how can we help you? Yeah, thank you, sister. Um, so it's not too early to ask that question. Um, it might be too early to exactly say like how exactly how confident, but I can tell you what we're doing to work on it. So um, right now, Edgar and I have been working through a plan that Edgar hatched um, to, to get me to a point where I can um, preach um, in Spanish from a manuscript. Um, so we'll be working through that plan, actually starting this week. Um, so um, 
we'll see where that goes. You know, there's a there's a potential where um, I might we might get there, and I'm able to preach in Spanish. Um, and if if that's the case, praise the Lord. You know, but I'm also if I need help, then I'm definitely going to need help. <laughs> um, so I think either way, I'm going to need some kind of help. You know, um, uh, what I what I would what I what I envision is likely, uh, I would hope to be able to preach from a manuscript, but I still think that um, come January, I'm still gonna need help with things like normal conversations with people, counseling, things like that. Um, sometimes it can be very hard. Um, sometimes it gets easy to say what you wanna say, and sometimes it's very hard to hear um, what someone is trying to say. Um, it can be hard in English. <laughs> Um, and, you know, to judge body language and facial expressions and shifts in tone. Um, and when you're talking another language, it can get really, really hard. And especially, nothing against Dominicans, but man, Dominicans speak fast. You know, so it's, um, so it, yeah, yeah, Cubans too, Cubans too. But, um, so I think I'm going to need help regardless, but uh, we're, we're doing the best we can to make it easier. Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you're breaking the rules. It's okay. Go ahead. What was that? Go ahead. Well, let me, let no, me no, get you no. a mic real quick because I know we have people yeah. that are watching. I want to make sure yeah. everybody's able to right. be encouraged with whatever you want to say. We're going to let Nancy break the rules. It's all good. <laughs> I'm messing with you, Nancy. <laughs> uh, I just, you know how the Lord says that you know, man plans his way, the Lord directs his steps. How encouraging to see, like, Pastor Marcos come, he's like now thinking, okay, I'm thinking in Spanish and I got to speak in English, but through the years, you know, what an encouragement to have, you know, endured through the years with the same church for many years um, and seeing the work that the Lord, the Lord has done and how they had plans. Okay, we're going to go at this time. And then, you know, it yeah. was the Lord's perfect timing that got them there with the Rusies, you know, which came up um, and the Rusies are now there with them. And now you're working towards speaking Spanish. And I'm just encouraged, and, and I want to encourage you. And Thank you, sister. It's a bittersweet thought, um, and I'll cry because I love your wife. I love you guys. Thank you. The thought of you guys going, but, like, seeing those pictures of you guys out there and the people and, and knowing as, you know, believers when we go out in faith and we share the gospel, how, uh, you know, how Brother Ryan's like, God's present, you know, in the midst of it. We Amen. We know that the Lord's doing a work and seeing those pictures, so encouraging. And so just wanted to encourage you, like mm -hmm. right now it's like, oh yeah, it's a lot to learn Spanish. I know I've tried to learn Spanish as an adult and it's not easy. Um, but like Pastor Marcos now, you know, fluent yeah. in Spanish and trying to think English, you know, to communicate yeah. to us, you know, like, wait, what do I have? So be encouraged and Thank we you. love you and, and praise God for the work that he's doing and has done just even in this time, you know, this past week. The, Thank the you so much, sister. Gospel yeah. that's gone forth. So, Amen. praise God. Thank you, sister. Appreciate that. You know what? You can break the rules anytime <laughs> to be that encouraging. <laughs> well, um, let's uh, let's finish off. Um, if you guys have any more questions, um, you can come and talk to me. I'm an open book. Um, I know these brothers are the same as well. Um, even if you think of something later on, uh, feel free to ask us. Um, we're really excited. We're very thankful to the Lord. Um, for what he has been doing, um, and, uh, you know, we're very humbled by it, too. Um, I am, you know, it's, it's a blessing just to work for him, you know, but it's a, it's a really special, special blessing to work for him and then to see, um, to see some fruit for it. You know, it's fine enough to work, but uh, to get something, to, to, to see some fruit for that is, um, is major. And that's not, again, it's not my work, and it's not your work. That's his work. And so praise the Lord for all of that. And may, may the Lord Jesus Christ, may he get all the glory, and may he receive the reward for his suffering. So uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I, I am so thankful for what you have been doing in Dahabon. I um, thank you for um, my, my brethren. Um, brethren like the brothers up here with me um, who, who travel um, to do this work, um, 
you know, using their, their own money, their own time to, uh, uh, to, to work in your vineyard, to, to see uh, people converted. I thank you for the brethren here as a whole um, who um, encourage and give of their own finances, who pray, um, who do all of these things, Lord, um, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of, of your name. Um, and Lord, um, uh, we thank you for you and your own power, um, your own work, all of your mighty deeds, um, and how um, within um, and how it, within your mighty deeds you decide to use us um, lowly, weak people, uh, full of faults, and you decide to do things through us, through our preaching. You save people, and we, we thank you for that, Lord. Please continue this work in Dahabon. Please, Lord, um, may you glorify the name of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in it. Um, please build a core group of people and um, prepare me and my family and even another family to go and mature us and help us um, um, through all of the difficulties. And please guide us um, and give us wisdom in every way. Um, not for our own glory, Lord, not for the glory of Cornerstone Baptist Church, not for the glory of um, Antorcha or of uh, Cristo Salvador, but um, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.